Next up is uh, Stephen Austin from um, Texas DOT. He's going to talk to us about uh, developing uh, preservation strategies for signature bridges. Glad to be here. Glad to be talking to you all today. Um, as Dick mentioned, I'll be talking about uh, TxDOT's efforts in developing preservation strategies for signature bridges. Uh, signature bridges, um, yesterday Kevin called them high value bridges um, or whales. Uh, right now we're calling them uh, signature bridges, uh, but maybe the, the high value bridges might stick. Um, when it comes to bridge, bridges, there's birth, there's death, and in between there's maintenance, right? Uh, the, better, uh, uh, the better we do with, in terms of maintenance, bridge maintenance, the longer we have between the birth and the death, and the better we do with bridge maintenance, the uh, less likely that the bridge uh, death is going to be catastrophic or of, of significance, right? So it's important that we do bridge maintenance. Um, I know everybody in this room is probably familiar with this concept. We had a few folks in the new member orientation uh, yesterday. I think there were 30 people in that room. So high level, um, you know, we change oil in our cars. We replace our roofs on our homes. We do maintenance in our homes. Uh, we maintain our roadways even. Uh, but a lot of times we forget about our bridges. Um, uh, so, so this is maybe a reminder for us all to be intentional with our bridges. And here lately, I think we've heard a lot of uh, the use of the word intentional. And it, when it comes to, to bridge maintenance, we really do have to be intentional, right? A lot of the items that we do maintenance on are not seen by the traveling public. A pothole will be addressed because the public will call uh, a local government or call a, a county commissioner, uh, uh, call uh, maybe a commissioner at TxDOT even. And so, so the pothole will get addressed, but, uh, but we have to be intentional when it comes to uh, maintenance of substructure and so forth. When we look at a bridge, um, our bread and butter at TxDOT are pre-stressed concrete bridges. So this is a typical overpass there on the left, um, and maybe a three-span pre-stressed beam bridge. Uh, our, our costs in Texas are about $80 a square foot, maybe going up a little bit. Um, in the in the economic situation that we're in, so f the structural costs for a bridge like this, from abutment to up to abutment, are about a million dollars. You had traffic control, traffic handling, and so forth. Um, you know, we're a multi-million dollar project, right? A larger, much larger project, but the bridge itself is uh, is about eighty dollars a square foot, brand new. Um, and our and our policy on bridge maintenance for typical bridges is spelled out pretty clearly in our, in our maintenance operations manual at TxDOT. We say, the structural and operational characteristics of all bridges and tunnel structures should be preserved as near as practical to the originally constructed or subsequently modified conditions. So, so that pretty much says, hey, let's take care of our bridges in as uh, close a situation as we can to, to the original structure. And not very detailed, but we do have a little blurb about uh, bridge joints should be evaluated during routine bridge inspection and if needed cleaned um, or, and resealed. So we're taking one step a little bit further and uh, going to add into the maintenance operations manual discussion on a couple of other areas, right? Uh, addressing clearing debris from channels, clearing debris from tops of caps, cleaning and sealing joints, clearing bridge drains, maintenance of pin and hanger assemblies, and, and probably even washing steel bridges in coastal areas. So these are things that I think everybody in this room understands, um, but in a general sense are not, uh, aren't, aren't specifically spelled out in our maintenance operations manual just yet. Um, also, you know, the importance of, of doing timely actions. The time to repair roof is when the sun is shining. This is really important, right? We've heard of, of many situations where um, a culvert is washed out or, or completely undermined because uh, we weren't timely with removing debris in a channel. So ahead of hurricane season is the time to, to be clearing that debris. Like oil changes and tire rotations, we need to be planning work systematically, tracking uh, our work and annual expenses, uh, planning uh, our budget and, and future years maintenance actions around um, the needs for our bridges. So it sounds easy to do when you've got one vehicle, right? But when you've got 36,000 on-system bridges in Texas, it's a different game, right? 
Um, and we've got, in, in a single district, one district has uh, about 3,800 bridges. Um, and, and, then, and then the next, uh, next, the district with the next second most bridges has 3,200 bridges. So we're talking about a lot of bridges. So we know that the squeaky wheels get the grease, right? I'm talking about uh, vehicles. So it might be that we've got 3,500 bridges to, to maintain, but that one that's, that's um, got the pothole might, might have the, or um, might have the punch through, will get the attention, right? We'll, we'll be uh, focused on that. But thankfully we have resilient bridges, right? So we don't have to worry about the 3,500 bridges necessarily and, and worry about an item uh, slipping through the cracks on, on most of our bridges. But when it comes to our signature bridges or the high value bridges, um, we do wanna make sure that, that we take necessary steps because replacement's gonna be a whole lot more than that $80 a square foot. Some of these preservation, some of these signature bridges are the Pecos High Bridge, Fred Hartman Bridge, Veterans Memorial Bridge, Rainbow Bridge, the list goes on. We probably have about 20 bridges or so that we think, hey, we, we need to make sure we develop a plan um, and, and make sure that we're, we're on top of that plan, that we're proactive, that we're intentional with this maintenance. I know a lot of people in this room probably don't recognize these bridges or these names, so I'll go into a little bit of detail on, on a few of these. The Pecos River Bridge, it provides access. Um, it's in, it's in uh, at the border, um, kind of in West Texas there, at the border between Mexico and, uh, near the border between Mexico and, and the United States. Uh, it provides access for US-90 over the Pecos River Canyon as uh, the Pecos River tees into the Rio Grande River. The bridge is uh, 280 feet above the channel and um, it, relatively speaking, it's a short bridge. It's got a, a, a continuous three-span deck truss it was open to traffic in 1957. It was rehabilitated in 2010. And obviously we have the, the uh, luxury right now as we're developing a preservation plan to review uh, the inspection reports and previous history on the bridge. So these are, are important pieces of information that we can use to, to decide what are the key areas that we need to make, that we need to take action on the, to, to preserve this, this bridge. What are things that we've done historically that we probably will need to do again. Um, the rehabilitation in 2010 was a, a redecking and a, and a repainting on the bridge. So those are things that we want to make sure that we consider and that we include. So a preservation plan for this bridge um, is really a four-page document. Um, it's, it's our commitment to, to identify the uh, major components of the bridge, activities that we want to take for, uh, to address uh, potential issues, um, planned issues, we know that the paint's going to need to be recoded. Um, we know that the, there's going to be deck issues that we want to uh, seal the, the deck. Um, so we've got activity, frequency, and a cost, and, and maybe a, a, a schedule included here for these preservation actions that we think are, are important enough to have documented and, and to make sure that we, we follow up with, because again, replacement is not just gonna be $80 a square foot. On Another bridge uh, I mentioned, the Fred Hartman Bridge. It provides access for State Highway 146 across the Houston Ship Channel. This is a, a major uh, uh, signature bridge. It's uh, uh, one, of our, one of our big whales, uh, one of our big babies um, uh, that we're proud of. It's a twin structure with a three-span cable-stayed main unit of 625, 1,225 and 625, so these are, are, are is, a, is a major bridge, obviously, right? It was open to traffic in 1995. Shortly after it was open to traffic, there was uh, issues with vibration of the cables uh, that led to, led to um, uh, a significant investigation, significant studies, and then a cable retrofit soon after the opening. When, um, as part of the, the uh, design, the, uh, the engineer prepared an owner's manual. It's 350 pages of a lot of information on loads, on the design approach, um, and, and then it's got about six pages on maintenance and repair procedures. 
these six pages are mostly um, mostly reactionary. You know, hey, if you've got an issue with expansion joints, this is what you need to be doing. Um, cable stay system. If a cable goes out, you need to move the traffic over. In fact, there's a page devoted to how to shift the traffic over. I think we'll figure that out if we need to shift the traffic over. But um, there's nothing in here that really talks about programmatic or planned cyclic maintenance. So that was an area that we wanted to, to focus on. Going back to, uh, to, the, um, uh, to the cable vibrations, we committed uh, back in 2002 or so to implement an acoustic monitoring system to, to keep an eye on, on um, the, vib uh, the, the indications or the, po the possibility of wire breaks to occur. Um, so we, we had that system in place uh, for almost 20 years, and somebody said, hey, we get all these reports. Uh, do they mean anything? Do we need to dig into them any further? And, uh, and so, of course, we, we said, well, that's a good question. Let's dig into it a little further. Um, so we did a magnetic flux leakage scanning of the lower 50 feet of all southbound cables and found no indication of loss of metallic area. So we continued to get these indications of possible wire breaks that we'd put into a folder and say, hey, we have a possible wire break that... Um, but the usefulness of this is in question, right? If the magnetic flux leakage is saying, hey, you don't have any indication of, of loss of metallic area. Uh, so we, we sat down and were intentional about developing a plan to, to uh, assess the bridge. And we came up with a, a, a new approach to inspect the bridge in more detail at a five-year interval. So this includes a hands-on inspection of most components on the structure. Uh, cable inspection and force estimation to make sure that, hey, over the history there is not a significant change, that there's not a cable that's, that seems to be carrying load but maybe isn't. And then to do a detailed survey of, of the bridge along the, the length of the structure. So this led to, okay, following the same approach that we did with PECOS, what are cyclic bridge, act, bridge preservation actions that we should be taking? How can we be intentional uh, after after the bridge has been in service for as long as it has to, to plan on cyclic activities. Of course, we know we have condition-based maintenance. If the joint uh, starts falling apart, well, we'll get a call and, uh, or the district will get a call and, and we'll have to, have to respond to that. Those things we, we're pretty good about doing, uh, but that cyclic bridge preservation actions was where, where we needed to, to focus. So we came up with a preservation plan. We reviewed that owner's manual and tried to identify areas of concern. We reviewed previous inspection reports and similar to, to the Pecos Bridge. We came up with a, a plan, um, which is again our commitment to, to, try to try to raise awareness, increase awareness, and be intentional with, with preservation of this bridge. Another example. Uh, of uh, signature bridge is uh, the Rainbow Bridge. This is State Highway 82 over the Intercoastal Canal out in East Texas. It, there's a, uh, the bridge is, is 7,707 feet long. Uh, it's got pre-stressed beams, steel girder units, and a 1,428-foot uh, truss unit. The bridge was constructed in 1939, rehabilitated in 1997, and then rehabilitated again in 2015. This uh, 2015 preservation was, was really one of the first major um, projects that we uh, de developed as what we are now calling our bridge maintenance improvement program that was focused on, on rehabilitating bridges in general. So funds specifically dedicated to preservation maintenance of, of bridges. So as we're developing this preservation plan for this bridge, we come across an issue. So the superstructure condition rating for this major bridge is a four, but you dig into the load rating associated with that member and you find, well, that load rating is really high. Is a four really appropriate? When, um, when you look at, at some of the photos here, maybe a little difficult to see, but that's a floor beam. There's a hole in the floor beam at, at a girder. Um, and, and, uh, but 
the load rating indicates that there's plenty of capacity. I think it's HL, HL uh, or HS34, or so something like that, very high. Um, and that's inventory rating. So we're trying to be intentional about, well, what are preservation actions that we need to take? So in, in coming up with this plan, we said uh, we've got an upcoming fracture critical inspection, a non-redundant steel tension member inspection. We'll mobilize, we'll take advantage of that mobilized team to perform maybe a more detailed condition survey. And as part of that, it'll be, uh, we'll have them prepare more detailed recommendations that would, normal, that would normally be provided as part of a, a fracture critical inspection. Um, and very likely that, that assessment will lead to a ps &E project uh, for, for preservation. So we tried to be intentional with taking advantage again of, of a, a team that was already going to be mobilized on the bridge. So we, uh, we came up with a preservation plan, just like we did for the other two examples. Um, and, and here we've got, again, the major components, same thing with act activities that we believe are, uh, need to be done, frequency, and, and even added costs, um, and a schedule last, uh, last time that this activity was performed and when we think, it, or when we'd uh, recommend it be done on a cyclic basis. Okay, so now that we have a preservation plan, now what? Good, good to have it on paper. Now let's, let's, let's execute something. I, a district uh, came back to me and said, okay, so now, now what do we do? Uh, well, that's, that's a good question, right? How do I get that bird dropping on the Pecos River Bridge off if, uh, if it's now on paper? How do, I, how do I make that happen? So I said, well, you know, that's part of the puzzle. The, the coming up with, with a documented plan is part of the puzzle. So we're kind of at, at step three right now uh, with that district. So step one was designate a district champion for this effort so that there's ownership at, at the district level. It's not just district, it's not just bridge division headquarters that's pushing this initiative. Step two was identify and prioritize bridges to be included. Step three was develop a plan for each bridge identify, list preservation actions, assign frequency to preservation actions. So here we've got uh, step four, assemble a programmatic schedule for a district's bridges. And uh, step five is bridge staff work with district leadership to program the work, to really make it happen, identify what pots of money are available. Is that district discretionary? Is that maintenance, statewide maintenance money? Or is it, um, a, part of federal funds that are specifically intended for bridge maintenance. And then uh, step six would be, hey, let's keep this on our radar each year. Let's incorporate this into an annual planning meeting. Let's make sure that we don't lose track of these, these major bridges. So programmatic maintenance, uh, like a fleet of vehicles, like you would take care of a fleet of vehicles is important. Um, uh, we need to be flexible on our policy for limiting funds at intervals less than 10 years. So a district said, hey, we know that, uh, that your policy at, at bridge division is, is to not uh, to rehabilitate a bridge or to address a bridge using our, uh, using our category six, we call it uh, funding, um, and, and, and to not return to that bridge in 10 years. But there are some items that we say, hey, we want to we wanna touch up this painting so that it doesn't get worse. So we're on board with, um, with being flexible on our policy to, to not return to the bridge in, uh, at, within 10 years. And then, uh, but uh, uh, there are challenges with this new concept. Uh, again, it's driven by, by bridge division, at least initially, but we've got a lot of interest from the district bridge, uh, bridge staff. So, um, and then another challenge is, is which bridges to include. So, um, with, with as many bridges as we've got, we've got to pick those that we think we, we need to prioritize and we need to spend time on. Um, and then, of course, when it comes to execution of the project, um, being aware that change orders are going to happen, we're going to find different conditions out on the bridge, um, and, and accepting that, hey, our commitment to preserving this bridge involves our commitment to, to uh, funding changes that, that, uh, that we find in the field. So just a, a recap, um, 
We, we need to be intentional with our bridge preservation. Trying to use historic actions to, to plan future maintenance actions is important. Um, when we're using NDE methods, we need to be thinking critically of the value and how we are using this information for decision making um, and how we move forward. We need to be validating our findings, fi questioning um, the results that we're getting and, and digging in, willing to, to dig into them and then willing to, um, to revise our monitoring approach and, ins uh, and inspection plans. Um, finally, uh, taking advantage of mobilized inspectors for in-depth assessments has been something that we've, we've uh, tried to be more intentional about. Uh, the Rainbow Bridge was, was uh, one of the second projects that we've done that on and we'll be doing that here uh, very likely moving forward. So that's, that's just more collaboration with the inspection folks and, and the preservation folks. So that's it. Uh, thank you. Sure, if there are any questions. Hey Steve, uh, great presentation. Um, on the Fred Hartman Brid Bridge, there was the acoustic monitoring. And I wanna know if you see value in that going forward based on your experience using the mag flux afterwards and determining that there weren't any breaks. So I just w was wondering, you know, that you always wanna have, if you're gonna do some type of monitoring, you wanna have actionable you know, outcomes based on that monitoring and, and as you alluded to, there may not have been in that case. And I just want to know what your opinion is on that going forward for that type of bridge. I think that that really is a, probably a case by case decision. Um, I hate to say that, that it's a bad system. Just for us, it, it, uh, it was causing more questions than, than giving us answers. Um, we pulled, before pulling the plug on that plan, we pulled uh, a couple of states um, and, and there are different perspectives. In fact, um, one state that we reached out to within their own state, they had very different um, monitoring systems on, on their different cable state bridges. So I think just, just um, some, ver some verification, some validation, um, as, we've, as we've shifted to magnetic flux uh, to evaluate, um, you know, there's, there was a research project, uh, NCHRP research project that was done, I think 2016 or so, that says, hey, this is the most reliable method. Um, and depending on, on which firms you talk to, say, man, I don't know anything. I, I don't, I haven't gotten anything reliable from magnetic flux leakage. So I think it's still, it's still, there's still a lot of unknowns in, in that area and, and questions on reliability that, uh, that remain. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.